This past week was a very difficult week for our school children because we would have had two snow days, but they were on spring break. <laughs> One last note about Father Sam before I begin the homily. Uh, Father Sam is the parochial vicar at St. Joan of Arc Catholic Parish in Farvada, and he lives with uh, two other priests, and they also serve um, the university, uh, the Colorado School of Mines. And so all throughout the Archdiocese of Denver, there's 108 pastorates, kind of a clumping of priests around a, a, a pastor who serves one or more parishes, depending on cities, mountain, plains. Um, but the whole archdiocese spans the whole northern half of Colorado. It's I-70 and north, and then in the city it gets a little complicated, north of County Line Road, and then it gets back, uh, and then we gerrymandered in Aspen, um, and it goes all the way out to the border, and then Pueblo has Grand Junction. So it's a seven hour span in our diocese. Um, it's a very large territory, and there's a number of priests serving in a number of territories. So just a, uh, um, an invitation, if ever you're out uh, on vacation to another spot uh, within our archdiocese or any other, just check out a new church to see different bulletins, to hear different homilies, um, to see different church churches and church layouts and art and architecture. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And so there's a number of of that, there's a priest in our archdiocese who's made it his goal to celebrate Mass in all of the churches of our archdiocese. I don't know where he is. Do you know where he is on that, Father Chris? No. But he's plugging away at it. So, uh, today's homily is going to be a little bit of a grammar lesson because we really need to get back into school mode from our spring break children who've been skiing and... Um, spending time sleeping in and on their iPads. So, this first reading uh, that we have here from Jeremiah is a fairly pivotal reading of the Old Testament. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Covenants, the Lord had been constantly making covenants with Israel. What is a covenant versus a contract? A contract is, is an exchange of goods and or services between two different parties. I give you money, you give me oxen, I give you sheep, you give me bricks if you play Settlers of Catan. Whatever it is, that's a contract. A covenant is an exchange of persons, not hostage situation but an exchange of one's life, a self-gift. That's why we see marriage not just as a legal contract, although it does have ramifications in the legal world, but marriage is also a covenant, a self-gift of persons. And so here, the prophet is speaking on behalf of the Lord, the days are coming, says, Lord, when I will make a new covenant, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember, Israel was split. That's a different homily. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers. The day that I took them by the hand and led them forth <clears throat> from the land of Egypt, for they broke my covenant, and I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. <clears throat> but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Henry, can I have my water, please? I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will place my law within them, thank you, and write it upon their hearts. No longer will they have need to teach their friends and relatives how to know the Lord. All from the least to the greatest shall know me. This new covenant, what on earth is that there's a part of the mass in which we actually use the term new covenant now here's how here's how the biblical world works if you use a certain phrase it triggers something if i were to say we the people 
of most precious blood. Someone from New Zealand would be like, oh, that's nice. But an American would necessarily hear an undertone or a slight reference to something else. And we can use that in oration to emphasize, to add flesh to speech. And the Bible does this. Whenever there is a book that was written later that's referencing a former book and it uses a very certain phrase, it's knowing that you know that phrase. Why? Because most people, especially most of the ancient Jews, memorized most of the Torah. And so if you had it in your head, and then the specific phrase was mentioned, then it's a direct reference to everything that's happening there. We're about to find out what I'm setting up. Now, we have a, a bit of a grammar lesson that needs to happen first. Um, can I get some help? Can I get uh, Jack? Would you be willing to come up here? No, that's okay. <laughs> He's, you're not in trouble. Even if you're in Lala, you don't have to. But you're welcome to. It'll be fun. It'll be the funnest grammar lesson you've ever had. Um, Evie, can you come up? Harper, can you come up? Where did... Oh, she went to the bathroom. Inopportune. Riley, can you come up? Nice. And Tommy, can you come up? Great. Thank you. Come, I'll come right here. You don't have to say anything. I'm not going to quiz you. I would let you know ahead of time. Great. If the taller of the two of you could stand one... So you're taller, so if you'd stand right here, and then if you would stand in front of her. Tommy, if you would stand, you're a tad taller. Great. And then you can, you can face, you can face me, because that'll be harder. Go ahead and come right here. Okay, so, I'm gonna assign you a part of speech. Do we, do, well, I promised I wouldn't quiz you, so I won't quiz you. <laughs> you're gonna be a noun. You're going to be a noun. A noun, remember, is a person, place, thing, or idea. It's a concept. It's necessarily pointing to something in reality or even imagined reality. But it's a reference that all of us know. You are a pronoun, and you are a pronoun. Okay. Pronouns, especially demonstrable pronouns, help us understand the relationship of the noun. So if I said car, and you're like, great, what do I do with that? If I say my car, okay, now we have a time, a place, a setting. We know we're not talking about 100 years ago. If I say his car, if I say her car, then we can add suppositions to that. While it might not be completely true, we might be able to suppose, if I say his car, that we're not talking about a pink Volkswagen bug, or a Mary Kay car, although we don't completely know that. But we can infer, through language, patterns of culture, okay? Different cultures use language in a very different way. Okay, so nouns, I want you to just stand there like this. Like you're really upset. You're never upset, so you don't know how to do that. So, um, <laughs> go ahead. Can you cross your arms like this? Great. Because you are just holding, as a noun, you're just holding the concept. You're just holding the concept uh, that you contain as your word, okay? Great. You and you are pronouns. So if you can point, just point to the person in front of you. Okay. Now, the reason I'm doing this, it seems very simple, but to English speakers, this is a harder concept. Most other languages, most other languages have what's called gender in the language, which, in which nouns arbitrarily are feminine or masculine. And sometimes it really doesn't make sense. But if that's the case, then pronouns are going to be really important because if the pronoun's being used, his or her or that or this, then it's going to be pointing to something. And when the gender changes, then it necessarily changes the concept. In English, if we say that, we don't know if that ever changes, which is an intricacy of English. Okay. You guys are going to be my masculine pronouns, right? 
English, Spanish, French, all modern day languages minus German, most modern day languages minus German, are feminine and masculine. German has neuter, ancient languages also have neuter. Greek has neuter, which means it's genderless, but it operates as if it's another gender. Are we bored yet? Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, you don't get to be my feminine <laughs> pronouns. You have to be my neuter pronouns, but that's okay. You'll be lovely anyways, okay? Great, so you're still pointing to the noun, you're still pointing to the noun, and the nouns are still holding on to their concept. Good, okay, great. So there's this part in the mass that's really important. This part in the mass that's really important are the words we call the words of institution. And the words of institution are what make Jesus present. It's what causes what we call transubstantiation. That's the part where you'll see Father Micah or myself say it with great intentionality, maybe even kind of bend forward. The altar servers we've taken from a tradition of the Mass actually incline their bodies at the hearing of these words, for they make Jesus present. Okay. In these words of institution, you know this. He took the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. Now, in Greek, bread is masculine. In Spanish and French, actually, it is too. And so we have the bread. Which one's bread? So we're masculine, so we're in this category. So your bread. Bread, can you raise your hand? You're now the noun that is bread. Great. Do you like bread? You don't like bread? Okay. Do you like sugar? Oh, okay. We're going to verify that later. And then you are, in this case, the. Sorry. You don't get to be as an exciting of a word, but you're a more useful word, right? So you're bread and you're the. He took the bread. The is masculine only because that's the way that it works in Greek. If you're using a masculine noun, you have to use a masculine pronoun. Okay. So he took the bread. Now, pronouns can operate, can, they can swap themselves out. This bread, that bread, that shows proximity or distance to the speaker, right? He took the bread and said, take this. The pronoun that Jesus should be using when he says, take this, would be, would you raise your hand, Jack? It'd be a masculine singular pronoun, take this bread. It's the same way that in, when, G, when God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, this. Why? Because Jesus is masculine. This is my beloved son, listen to him. The bread. However, hand down, thank you, keep pointing, keep being a pronoun, well done, thank you. However, when Jesus says, take this, all of you, and eat of it, labete toto, but you don't need to know that. He switches, and he says, take this. Can you raise your hand? Thank you. New pronoun, in this case, not a feminine pronoun, a neuter pronoun, even though we respect and love your femininity. A different pronoun. So in that language, it's indicating there's a switch going on. The reason I'm doing this so technically is when you move things from one language to another, things happen very differently. And you can't capture all the nuances in one language and put it into another language that doesn't necessarily have those categories. says, take this, all of you, and eat of it. Now, why would, it, why would Jesus use a neuter pronoun? He's no longer saying bread. If he were saying bread, he would say, take this. Since he's no longer saying bread, he's speaking about a new reality here. Take this, 
All of you eat of it. This is my body. And the way that you know he's not just speaking metaphorically is the pronoun change. That's how Greek works. Now, think to yourself, how would Jesus have said it? He would not have spoken Greek. He would have spoken Aramaic. How that works, I have not studied Aramaic enough that I know all of this stuff, but what do I know? The scriptures were recorded, were written down by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Greek. And so as they're trying to find how this happened and record it in the nuances of a particular language, they chose how to best express the reality of what they themselves experienced or heard from somebody else. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. All right, thank you for helping with the grammar lesson. You may go, that was not as hard as you thought it would be. But it's one of those things that has to be splayed out because people have a hard time grasping this in our minds because we just don't get gendered language. The adjectives have to be masculine or feminine or neuter depending on the nouns that they modify, all of those things. In Spanish, for those of you who are Spanish speakers or have studied it, you have esto, esta, ese, esa, aquel, aquella. You actually have three different levels of distance that's being communicated. And then you have masculine and feminine. But then you also have this one thing that's very necessary. If you're going to be a Spanish speaker, and you're going to be a Spanish speaker that's raising children, then you're going to be a Spanish speaker raising children, and you're ne necessarily going to find a total mess somewhere. In fact, I think that's a universal thing. But in Spanish, you have, ¿Qué es esto? ¿Qué es esto? Which is, sounds masculine if you're a Spanish speaker, but it's essentially neuter. It rises above the concept of masculine and feminine and just says, what is this whole thing right here? What is this new reality that's driving me absolutely nuts? ¿Qué es esto? Okay. When Jesus makes that switch of pronouns, from masculine to neuter. Then he took the bread, the bread that had been previously mentioned. Then he took the bread and said, take this, this being different. He's speaking about a new reality. Oh, okay. Now let's go back to the first reading. I will create with you a new covenant. Jesus is starting a new reality here. Now the beautiful thing is we can move into the consecration of the precious blood. Then he took the then after he said the blessing he gave the chalice to his disciples saying, "Take this again, the same this of a new reality. All of you and drink from it." This is the chalice of my blood. The blood of the new and eternal covenant. So this notion of a new covenant to the Jews there present are like, whoa, I smell a little Jeremiah 31 going on in here. Jesus, what are you doing? This is the new covenant that had been long awaited from the Old Testament. Eternal meaning it would be unchanging until the end of time. And my friends, from the Last Supper, from Holy Thursday, almost 2,000 years ago, the Catholic Church has been celebrating a continuous chain of this new and eternal covenant. Remember what a covenant is. Not an exchange of goods or services. Mass is not an exchange of goods and services. You don't come to Mass, punch your punch card, collect Catholic points, or Irish points for that matter, and then get to redeem them for heaven. That's not how this faith works. Mass is part of this covenant which is an exchange of persons. The Lord gives himself to us, and we in turn give ourselves to him. Which is why we start out in the Mass those times that we've withheld ourselves. 
let us call to mind our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, to make this self-gift, wherein I neglected to love and honor my spouse as I ought to have, as I promised to, wherein I was not as patient with my children as I could have been, wherein I was undisciplined and stayed up scrolling an extra hour while on my bed and I should have been sleeping because I get grumpy in the morning for the times that I've withheld myself from being a gift to God and to others, then we say, Lord, I'm sorry. We take this relationship, this exchange of persons with the Lord seriously. And the beauty of Mass is in receiving God's body and blood, the entirety of his person, not just symbolically. We saw that in the pronoun shift that was utterly technical, but very fascinating. This exchange of persons that the Lord gave everything. He gave everything So that in the Mass, we would have him in his entirety. We call it his body, blood, soul, and divinity. This new and everlasting covenant, it's the title of our parish. The Lord's most precious blood. From the words of institution, this blood, which is the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for what? The forgiveness of sins. Wherein you and I have self-withheld and not lived covenantally. The Lord has given himself in place of us. So we may be brought back into newness of life, freshness of heart. The living back out of the law, not because perfectionism is good, but because the law directs the way that we are to live in this self-gift. My friends, the beauty of what we do here is it transforms us individually. And with that individual transformation, then collectively, we are transformed as a community centered on the heart of our Lord and his most precious blood. Praised be Jesus Christ. I invite those who are preparing for the sacrament of baptism to please come forward. My last question for you is this. Are you a Philip or an Andrew? Or neither? In today's gospel, some foreigners approached Philip and said, we'd like to see Jesus. And for whatever reason, Philip did not take them to Jesus, but he knew who he could take them to. And he took them to Andrew, and Andrew took them to Jesus. If somebody's like, how do I get to know God? Are you Andrew? Can you actually disciple them in getting to know who Jesus is? And if you're not there yet, that's okay. At least you can be Philip. Do you have someone in your life that can connect people to Jesus? If you're neither, we actually have an evangelization workshop as well next weekend to just begin to have these conversations with family, friends, coworkers, People on the King Supers checkout line, whatever it is. It's on us to be Philip's or Andrew's so that we can be Christ like in the world. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy and grant that what at your prompting they desire they may receive by your generous gift. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.